excellent. Last week I uh, ministered a word on um, do not let them depart from your eyes. Talking about the word. Talking about the word. And the scripture uh, comes from Proverbs 3 and 4. It says, My son, attend to my words. Give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. And I uh, believe that the Holy Spirit moved on a on part of the word that was ministered to last week. And it was in Proverbs 3 and verse 21 to 24. And it was for those, those people who had strub, uh, trouble sleeping. So I got people to stand up and, and uh, I said, this word is for you. And I says, do not let these words here depart from your eyes. I says, my son, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion so they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then you will walk safely in your way and your foot will not stumble. And when you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. Praise the Lord. And so I said I was going to, this week I was going to give some testimonies. Uh, and so those who struggle, those are the ones that have stood up. Did anyone here put this to the test? Did anyone kind of let this word not depart from their eyes and they had sweet sleep this week? Anybody? Yes, come on. Can you come, come up and, and just share? Praise the Lord. Excellent. Praise God. So I didn't think I needed to get up when, last week. But I received it anyway. And um, I've been sleeping, for me, I usually get up, wake up about 4.30 in the morning. I've been sleeping until half past five, six o'clock. <laughs> That's sleeping in for me. So, yeah, and it's been really good, sweet sleep. Well, praise the Lord. Anybody else? Sweet sleep. Come on, honey. Praise the Lord. Yes, I answered this um, because... Um, I come from a family of insomniacs, we like to call ourselves, <laughs> because we don't go to sleep any earlier than 2 a.m. is our usual sleep times. Yeah. Um, this week, I've been out by 9.30, <laughs> <laughs> and I just wake, wake up, up like, like, oh my, oh my goodness, did I go to sleep early? Yeah. So, so it's, it's actually been amazing. amazing. Yeah, praise so the Lord. Very well Excellent. 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 Praise, praise the Lord, Lord. praise the Lord. Lord. His, His word works. His word is life. It is true. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. That's, That's excellent. excellent. All right, so uh, we're going to leave the um, attend to my words there. Uh, we're going to carry on with the power of the Holy Spirit. We're up to part three. Power of the Holy Spirit, part three. Praise the Lord. We began this um, series last week. We did part one last week and we carried on with part two this morning. So we're up to part three. And uh, what I tend to do throughout these um, sessions here is I like to open with um, some quotes from some um, generals of the faith. Um, this guy here, his name is um, Henry Blackaby. He's a um, pastor of a church in the States. And this is what it says here. It says, God speaks through a variety of means. In the present, God, uh, in the present, God primarily speaks by the Holy Spirit. Also speaks by and through the Bible, through prayer, and through circumstances in the church. So just read that again. God speaks through a variety of means. In the present, God primarily speaks by the Holy Spirit, through the Bible, prayer, circumstances in the church. Praise the Lord. This one's from A.W. Tozer. A.W. Tozer says, The spirit-filled life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. It is part and parcel of the total plan of God for his people. Isn't that good? Let's read it to you again. The spirit-filled life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. <laughs> you know, there's a word out there that the Rain writes are, um, what do they call us? Extremists. Christianity extremists. I like that. <laughs> The spiritual life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. It is part and parcel of the total plan of God for his people. Praise the Lord. All right, so let's uh, turn with me, please, to Luke 24, verse 44. 
If you don't have a Bible, we've got some down the back there. If you raise your hand, we can lend you one of ours. Luke 24, verse 44. Excellent. And so, so just, just bringing up, up to speed here, we're coming in now where Jesus has died, he was buried, and he was raised back to life again, and people are seeing him everywhere. Praise the Lord. He revealed himself to 500 people. And so now he's appeared to his disciples and he's ministering to them. And verse 44 it says, Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it was written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. In verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Till you are endued with the power from on high. And that word endued means to be clothed with or clothed in. To be clothed with or clothed in power. It's a sense of sinking into a garment. I like to use the word immersed. Now last week we had baptisms and people were immersed in water. When you dug them in the water, they're completely covered and surrounded. And sometimes it even goes inside. Uh, people's noses. My, I think my son took a real big gulp. <coughs> Brought him up. <laughs> and so he was surrounded in, he was immersed in a sense of sinking into a, a, a garment. He was clothed with water, but this is talking about being clothed with power from on high. So it's going from more of an omnipresent presence where God is around everywhere. He is with you when you sleep. He is with you when you're doing the dishes. He is with you at work. It's going, it's going from that to a more manifest presence where he's more of a tangible presence now where you see things and he changes the atmosphere and he changes the situation and circumstances. Praise the Lord. So verse 49, So behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The word tarry is an interesting word. Tarry. In the Amplified, they use the word remain. In the CEV, it uses the word stay. In the Good News Translation, the MEV and the NMV uses the word wait. Wait. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem or remain in the city of Jerusalem or stay in the city of Jerusalem or wait. Hold. Tarry. The Young's literal translation is the word abide. Now in the Greek, the Greek covers all these words. In the Greek is the word kathitso, kathitso. And it means to seat down or to sit down, to seal, to hover, to dwell. It's to sit or be seated. It's to sit or be seated. It's to make somebody sit down. Stop running around, just whoa, 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 whoa. Grab a seat. <laughs> just sit down. Breathe. And it's quite opposed to our, the society that we live in today. We're, we're a hurry, hurry, hurry generation. Uh, if your two-year-old toddler sitting in the trolley yells out, pick a lane full, to another toddler in the trolley, that's an indication you might have hurry sickness. Uh, Google, for instance, boasts how fast it can search a million sites and comes up with how many seconds it was able to search all these sites and these are the, these are, uh, uh, the, the sites that, on which you were searching for. Um, a car, for instance, boasts how good a car engine is by how fast it can go from 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds or 4 seconds or whatever. So we're in this hurry, hurry, hurry sickness world. Uh, I remember I, I was coming back from McLeod's Bay one time and um, I pulled out of the, there's um, Whangarei Heads Road and it goes on to, into Paru Bay and I pulled out there and I was heading back into town and this guy, he was, he was, he was speeding and I, I was in a Sunday cruise mode 
Come on, sister, just cruise it. He gets stuck behind me. Now, if you know anything about that road out there, from Paro Bay all the right way into town, there's only one lane. There is no overtaking. And so I can... I was just... I, I don't get pressured very easily. So I was just in cruise mode. And this guy, I could see him in the rear view mirror. He was spitting tax. He obviously in a hurry to get somewhere. So anyway, he, uh, and I was just going all the way into town, the windy road. It takes about, I don't know, 10, 10 or 15 minutes to get into town. And I uh, threw on, on it out here and <laughs> down to Riverside. And finally, Riverside opens up into two lanes. Finally. So this guy just tears off on the other side of the lane, overtakes me. And, and I could kind of, I'm looking at him like this, out of the side of my eyeballs, because you don't want to look at him. And uh, he's full on. Looking and swearing and, and you know single fingered salute, and uh, and just as he did that, he must have been going 70, 80 k's. Who was tall past me? Police officer came around the, around the bend in the other direction. Woo! Turned around and then pulled him over. And as I was passing him, I thought about doing a little. Do. But I thought, you know what? I better just just leave it alone. <laughs> But I find probably the most stressed drivers on the road are the ones that are in a hurry. They're in a hurry, 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 hurry. And what we see here is that, uh, and if you know God, God is never in a hurry. Sometimes we need things now. <laughs> We're in this right now. God always never seems to be in a hurry. And sometimes when it seems when we need God to hurry up and come through, we found ourselves being made just slow down. Sit down, wait. And it's the worst thing in the world. <laughs> you feel like, oh, just come on, Lord. I think the power is just wait. And uh, what we find is that there is a rejuvenating power that comes from tarrying or waiting on the Lord. Sometimes you need to just slow down and just wait. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So turn with me to um, Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. We're coming in at verse 28. <laughs> right? Isaiah 40 and verse 28. And it reads, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. Verse 29, he gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. So there we can see there is an enduring with power here. There is a equipping of rejuvenation. There is an increasing of strength. There is an enduring with power. There's an equipping of rejuvenation, become rejuvenated, and then an increasing of strength. And sometimes we are in no condition to face what needs to be faced, so God sits us down and makes us tarry to increase your strength. Just wait. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so verse 30, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Praise the Lord. I remember one time we instituted Shabbat in our family for a season there, and we really need to kind of get back to that. Shabbat and uh, basically Shabbat is, is the Hebrew word for Sabbath Sabbath and the way the Jewish people um, do a Sabbath is that it begins on Friday sundown and it finishes on Saturday sundown and um, Shabbat really uh, became a family time for us um, and you're not allowed to do any work doesn't that sound nice for a day no work at all not even cooking you had to kind of pre-cook your meals. 
Yeah, so you've got to do, you, Friday is just all go, go, go until Friday sundown because you've got to prepare meals and you've got to get stuff sorted out and, and um, so everything needs to be organised but there is no work, there is no TV, there's no devices. Yes! <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can go for a family walk if you want to or do some board games and so it was a time really where we were just um, doing Shabbat and even though it was really difficult to begin with, because you know we live in a place, uh, in a generation now where our devices have become an extension of our of our hand, and we, all we want to do is look on what's the news and, and look on what's what's going on in other people's lives and that kind of stuff. But to put it down and to do Shabbat was a was a real test. But I came away during that season feeling rejuvenated and increased in strength. Shabbat was made for man. Man wasn't made for Shabbat. Shabbat was made for man. Uh, for me now, a Sabbath day is essential. Sometimes uh, I find myself still working on, on days I should be having off, which is I usually set aside on Monday. And somewhere down the line, if I don't, if I don't actually take a break, my body just takes it from me. My, my, I find my body just shuts down for a day. Just like, oh, and I'm just... Crook as. Ask my wife, she knows. Um, that repeat those words <laughs> and so I, I find a day of rest is, is essential. Some, we just need to rest a while. Rest is a good thing. Amen. Shutting down and tarrying is a good thing. Now, uh, quite an interesting story uh, about King David. He was at Ziklag. And he comes back from, uh, from an offensive and he finds that his, his town had, had been ransacked. The Amalekites had come in and took all their children, had taken all their, their wives and they're, they've, they've boosted. And all their men and David, they said that they wept until they had no more uh, uh, strength to weep. Their, their soul was grieved, as it says. And that's a, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty hard place to be in when your soul is grieved. And all the men blamed David. David, this is your fault. You didn't, you didn't forward think this and think about leaving some men behind and defending our wives and our children. And so everybody's soul was grieved and everybody was looking at David. And so David was feeling the pressure more so than probably anyone. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. As the scripture says, he took time aside and strengthened himself in the Lord. And then he sought counsel. This is cool. Then he sought counsel. He didn't strengthen himself in the Lord by seeking counsel. He strengthened himself in the Lord first, and then he sought counsel. I remember uh, one ICFM a few years back, uh, we had Pastor Bob Yandy in here, and Pastor Bob, he's, a, he's one of the, the greatest teachers on the planet in the, in the Word. And um, he, he's, he talks very fast, and so you, know, you have to write down whatever, all his notes. But he had a question time. And so people were asking some questions like, you know, what's the difference between the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost and that kind of stuff. And I asked a question that was quite pertinent to me. And I just said, what do you do? How do you strengthen yourself when you feel like giving up? Like how did David do it? How did David strengthen himself in the Lord? How do you strengthen yourself when you feel like giving up? And he just, he said prayer. Pray. Take some time. And pray. Be with the Lord. And so in verse 29 here in Isaiah 40, it says, He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, He increases their strength. He took some time aside and increased strength with the Lord. Verse 30, Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Now it's quite interesting here because the youth got singled out here. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, you can ask the question, why are young people called out here? Uh, and what I came, well, I don't really discover because I was a young man once, funnily enough, is that young men are impulsive. They have no patience <laughs> whatsoever. The romance of a young man really and, and the love language which they've invented themselves is admiration. They like to be admired. I knew this because this, this is what I'm reading out to you. This is me to a T. It was. It's, it's a building of the ego. 
And so uh, young guys especially are renowned for showing off. Now my, my sons, for instance, is different to my daughter. My daughter, um, she has her own great qualities, but my sons like saying, Dad, look at me. Dad, watch this. Dad, let me show you as I throw myself off the trampoline into a pile into the grass. And uh, they, they're like, Dad, 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 because the romance of a young man is admiration. And um, they like to show off. And, and we're just, they're just young and impulsive. They, they don't, we have no patience. They just want to go, 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 go. I remember... Um, I went snow, this was probably the, maybe the second or third time snowboarding down the mountain. And, I, and I, uh, I parked up next to my nephew, Delane. And um, right in front of us was this kind of steep, steep bit. And it came up off, up into this big jump. The jump probably would have been like a ramp like that, probably the, this high off the ground. And um, usually it's, it's, it's perform, uh, to, for someone to take, a, take, a, take that kind of jump, you'd have to be fairly experienced because you're going to be flying through the air at um, you know, quite a bit of velocity and you need to know how to land. So I said to my nephew, do you want to see your uncle take this jump? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, go on. And so I came barreling down, 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 this, uh, down this ramp, went up the ramp and what I should have done if I knew the scriptures is I should have waited and tarried and practiced a little bit more <laughs> before taking the jump. All I saw was my snowboard go up into the, into the blue sky and it just stayed there. And so I was just flying through the air and um, this, this girl was, was on the other side of... of <laughs> this girl was on the other side of the ramp. She looks up and swears. She said a swear and went, yeah, as, as my butt was come flying towards her. And she scrambling out of the way. And I landed flat on my back, just went, boff! And I'm just lying there in the snow going, oh! And I felt like my lungs were bleeding. That's what I felt like. And um, I, I kind of sheepishly went up to my nephew afterwards. I go, did you see the whole thing? And he goes, yeah, I thought you landed it. Yeah, let's just run with that story. <laughs> but young people, uh, we're impatient. We don't want to wait and learn how to do things properly. We just want to, I got this. I remember our first trip with our, our snow trip with the youth. I said to our young people for, before we got up there, I showed them some videos here before we headed down to the mountain. I said, this is what could happen. And people were flying off everywhere and that kind of thing. And, um, and so I said, so we're going to, uh, I'll give you the opportunity to take some lessons with me on Happy Valley. And Happy Valley is like this, the slope's probably like that. And so you got little kids going down there and that kind of stuff and take some lessons. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll take some, take some lessons. And so, no, 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 I thought you were with us that time. Do you remember coming down to the snow trip with us? Yeah. yeah. Did you go flying down the mountain? You got stuck in the middle. Got, got the middle. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Anyway, so I said to, I said to the young people, right, so we're going to have some lessons. So they're going to, you want to have some? Yeah, we'll have lessons. And so anyway, we get there. I go to Happy Valley and I turn around and basically it was me, Milton, um, Joel and Esther. It was just four of us, and I see the rest of the young people, must have been 20 of them, going up, the, um, up to the top of the mountain. They don't want lessons now. They've, they're, they're in there in the moment. They're impatient. They're impulsive. We could do, go right to the top and come down the, come down the mountain now. With Pastor Dave. With Pastor yeah. Dave. <laughs> who thought he was Jean-Claude Pierre. And so in verse 30 it says, even the youth shall faint and be weary because we're impulsive and impatient. And young men shall utterly, utterly fall trying to take their ramp before you learn how to snowboard properly. But verse 31, but those who, renew their, uh, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. See, there is a time to walk there is a time to run, but there is also a time to wait. There is a time to wait. The word wait in the Hebrew is the word korvor, korvor. This is quite interesting. It means to bind together by twisting. To bind together by twisting. I think korvor was used when Jesus was binding together some whips as he was about to take out all the people in the marketplace. He actually set some time aside 
as he was looking at these guys defiling his father's house. <laughs> you could see him just like looking at these, oh, you're going to get it. And, he, and he's putting together some, uh, these whips. And so the word corvore is a binding together by twisting. Pastor Colin had this great example. If you could take a piece of string, it was easy to snap. But if you take that piece of string and you wind it around, twist it around a cargo rope, there is no way you're going to be breaking that little string because it's twisted around the cargo rope. Same thing with us. When we wait on the Lord, you are being bound to Father God, who is strong. And he will renew and increase you in strength. You shall run and not grow weary. You shall walk and not faint. Are you following me? Are you with me? And so, uh, core of war is to ex- as, as also means to expect, to look and wait expectantly. You're not just kind of waiting there and thinking, ho hum. It's like you're waiting for a bus. You're, wait- you're expecting the bus to show up. And uh, so you have this expectant attitude. So that's what core of war means. All right, let's turn to uh, John 11 and verse 1. John 11 and verse 1. Got me. Good. John 11 and verse 1. This is quite fascinating. I'm going to read a bit of scripture here, but that's okay. It says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And Jesus heard that, and he said, Sickness is not unto death. This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, and that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. He stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now the word stayed... The old King James Version says abode. And then the Greek is the word meno, which means he continued, he dwelt, he endured, he remained, waited, he tarried. So even though he heard that his 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 friend was sick, he waited. He waited two more days. God is never in a hurry. Verse seven. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you want to go there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, but because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. And his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However... Jesus spoke of his death. But though they thought that he was speaking about taking a rest and sleep. And Jesus said to them plainly, because obviously they didn't get it, well, Lazarus is actually dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. (laughs) We'll just leave that one there. We're not going to go there. Verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the woman around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard Jesus was coming, went and met him. And Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This is a a crisis level in her life. She's blaming Jesus now, getting angry with God. If you were here, this wouldn't have happened. Verse 22, but she retracts. She says, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe 
that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. And Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha had met him. Jesus was still waiting, tarrying, taking his time. And the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose quickly and went out following her, saying, Oh, she is going to the tomb to weep there. Then Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, and she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She said the same thing as her sister. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And the Jews said, See how he loved him. Verse 37, And some of them said, He could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying. And Jesus again groaning in himself came to the tomb. It was, it was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus says, Take the stone away. And Martha, the sister of whom he was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench. He had been there dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then he took the stone, he took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you have always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, said this, that they might believe that you have sent me. And now he said these things, and he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who died came out bound, hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped in with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, Loose him. Let him go. Loose him. And let him go. Powerful story. That's amazing. And see, what we see here is that uh, uh, Mary and Martha sought to get Jesus in their time frame. Quickly, he's about to die. Come quickly. We know you can heal uh, blind eyes and open ears and deaf ears. And we know you can heal the sick. So come quickly. And he waits two days. And so Mary comes and, and, finds, a, and finds Jesus where, where uh, he was speaking with Martha, still there, waiting, tarrying. Not moved by the situation or circumstances. It's quite interesting, I was watching uh, Rick Renner one time and he was in Jerusalem at the, at the tomb where they believe Lazarus had come out of. And what you find is that when you go into the tomb, it's a small hole like this. You, you've got to go down several flights of stairs until you're actually down there into the actual tomb. And so Lazarus, being made alive, would have had to kind of shuffle his way up, up, the <laughs> up these flight of stairs to get to where, where Jesus and everybody was. Because uh, he was still bound. He was still bound in, in the cere ceremonial cloths. But this is a powerful, powerful testimony of waiting on God. See, sometimes our situations and circumstances can force us to hurry and, and try and do things in our own strength. But Jesus tarried. He pulled the handbrake off and he waited. Praise the Lord. Turn with me um, to just over a few pages to John 15. Just read the first eight verses here. And it says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that he bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. But you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. That word abide, remember, it means remain, continue, wait, tarry. In me, and I in you. As the, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, wait, remain, tarry. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Wait, remain, tarry. I am the vine and you are the branches. And he who abides in me, wait, remain, tarry. And I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, wait, tarry, remain. He is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them with fire and they are burned. 
But if you abide in me, wait, remain, tarry. And my words abide in you. They wait, they remain, and they tarry in you. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you may bear much fruit, and so you will be my disciples. See, the effect of waiting and tarrying and abiding consists of abiding in God's word. In verse 7 it says, Abide in me and my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Abide in his word. Understanding the will of God, what the will of God is in this situation. You're asking God, abiding in his presence until you are what? Clothed in power. Are you with me? And so what we see back in uh, John 11 is that Jesus wait. He spent some considerable time aside abiding until he was clothed in power. And what kind of power was Jesus clothed in? Resurrection. See, they saw a, a degree of Jesus' power when he was healing the sick. Curing fevers, opening blind eyes, opening deaf ears. Curing all sorts of sicknesses and diseases but this is something else Lazarus was dead and he waited put some time aside he abided until he was clothed with resurrection power and so if you are facing crisis or hard times right now and you really need God to move wait tarry abide Abide in his presence. See what the will of God is for the situation. Abide in his word. See what needs to be bound or loosed in your life. Strengthen yourself in him and set some time aside of rejuvenation. See, doing things, remember, without the Holy Ghost, doing things in your own strength will tire you out. You can't do it. You'll burn yourself out. You need his presence. You need God. Therefore, we will wait, tarry, abide. Amen. Good preaching, Pastor Barry. Praise the Lord. It's quite interesting in the Old Testament, Israel, Israel was on the move. But they got to a point where God had a guts full of Israel. And he says, you know what? I'm going to keep my word. I'm going to send an angel to go out before you and drive out all the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, all those ites, the Marmites and the Vegemites, and the termites. They're going to drive them all out, but I'm not going with you. You can do it yourself. And I'll, I'll keep my word, because that's who I am. I can't. I, I'm a covenant God. But Moses, thank God for Moses. Moses... He was able to foresee and says, you know what, if you're not going, then we we're staying right here. We're going to wait, tarry, abide until we get this right, and then we can move forward. So I'm just going to ask the worship team just to come back. And um, this is going to be a, a great opportunity for you to come before God and just to wait a little bit to abide to tarry in his presence